Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. A couple of weeks we'll begin a, a series leading up to Easter, but I've just been taking a few weeks just to preach some messages I wanted to preach. And uh, that's what this one is. It's entitled, How Can I Change? Uh, and we find it as we're going to look at, at a very familiar story. Ex, uh, Genesis 32, beginning with verse 24. I'd read it to you, but I'm in the wrong book. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Somehow I ended up in my Sunday school lesson. There we go. All right. <clears throat> And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed them there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Father, I thank you today that your word is so relevant Uh, Even as we go back to the very first book of the Bible, there are things there that can help us and can open up our hearts uh, and our eyes. So, Lord, I pray that we might realize that uh, being a Christian is about change. It's about allowing you to change us, to mold us, to make us more like our Savior. So we pray that you'd speak to our hearts today. Lord, help us to be honest and open and responsive to you. In your precious name, amen. God's Word is really all about change. It's about the change that takes place in the life of somebody who's accepted Christ as as your Savior. Uh, Change is not always easy for some folks, especially uh, when it comes to the the whole idea of being saved and letting God take over in your lives. But I want to share some important things with you. But first of all, I want you to picture with me a scene in the Old West, say around the 1870s. Uh, There are some very weary cowboys uh, in their dusty Levi's. They're gathered around a blazing campfire. uh, And you can hear the Uh, The lonely notes of a coyote as a cowboy sits there and strums his guitar. The moon just kind of floats serenely overhead. Suddenly, a bellow of pain shatters the night as a cowpoke leaps away from the fire, shouting in agony because of hot rivet syndrome. Now, let me explain that to you. Hot rivet syndrome uh, in those days was caused by Levi's. Levi Strauss made them, in fact, their, their model, n- number 501, they wanted to make sure that these things would last, so they put some copper rivets uh, in stress places. And uh, that was fine because they did last forever. However, if a cowboy got too close to the fire for too long, those copper rivets got pretty hot, uh, and guys would jump up and down. Uh, and for years, these brave men of the West dealt with, with uh, hot rivet syndrome. Then in 1933... Walter Haas Sr., who was the president of Levi Strauss, went camping, and he was wearing his Levi 501s. He was crouched down in the high Sierras with a crackling fire when suddenly he jumped in the air uh, and shouted uh, with pain, uh, and he said, what is that? And the other guys with him kind of laughed, and they said, oh, haven't you heard about that? That's your old-fashioned hot rivet syndrome. You made it. Uh, And uh, so he said, it's not just me. He said, oh, no, we all have that problem. So he vowed those things, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he vowed they must go. So with my voice. <coughs> and at the de- next board meeting, <coughs> the board of directors voted in a change. <coughs> they made the, the copper rivets extinct on Levi's. So you guys who wear jeans in your near campfires once in a while, be thankful <clears throat> that hot rivet syndrome got changed. Now, God's Word is about something far more important than rivets being changed, obviously. The Apostle Paul tells us that when a believer gets saved, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. 
Um, actually, the Bible has a lot to say about the change that ought to be taking place in a Christian. For instance, Jeremiah 13, 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? <clears throat> then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. In other words, unless God intervenes, we're not able to change our evil into good. We can't do it by ourselves. Uh, Malachi 3, 6, the Lord said, I am the Lord, I change not. Because God is holy and he's perfect, there's nothing about him that needs to change. And he lays it out to us. Because we are sinners and we're not holy and we're not perfect, there's a lot about us that needs to change. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Somebody said the first part of that ought to be put up over every church nursery. Uh, we, shall, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Uh, and that's probably true. One day, when we're saved, we're going to be changed and made like our Savior. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. As we beheld the Lord's glory in His Word, it will change us, and it will make us more like Christ one step at a time, one day at a time. Now, we know God expects us to change when He forgives us of our sins. And history has borne out the fact that God changes men. We see men like Jacob, Peter, Paul, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, uh, and then more recently, guys like Billy Sunday, John Wesley, George Whitfield, uh, my dad, uh, and many of you who are here today uh, fit into that same qualification. So the question goes like this, how does God change lives today? <clears throat> you know, there's a problem that many people claim to be believers today. And I'm wondering if they're believers, why there hasn't been a change in their lives. People want to go to heaven today but they want to do it on their own terms. However, God's already set the terms. God said, you must be born again. Uh, and he says that means everything about you changes. So I think the obvious question to ask is, first of all, are you really saved? Can you honestly say old things have passed away and all things have become new? If you're saved today, are there some things in your life that need to change? Let me answer that for you. Yes. Uh, for every one of us. Many of us sometimes get frustrated because we know there's some things that need to be changed in our lives and, and we just don't know how to go about it. <clears throat> we don't know how to get it done. So I want to take a look today uh, at Jacob's life and see if we can't learn something uh, about how God works to create change in our lives. Now, as you get to this part, part in Genesis, ex, uh, excuse me, Jacob has left Haran and he's now on the border of the promised land, somewhere in the, in the mountains of Gilead. He's facing a crisis, and that crisis is called Esau, his brother. See, for 20 years, he's wondered whether Esau still planned to kill him. For 20 years, he's dreamed of going home, but each time uh, his dream just becomes a nightmare when he thinks of meeting up with Esau in all of his anger, because long years ago, he had deceived and cheated his brother and his father, uh, wanting to, to have all the inheritance to himself. And because of that, he got forced into having to leave home uh, and running for his life. Uh, and, and he ended up in Haran uh, with an uncle over there. And there, Jacob had managed to grow prosperous. Uh, he was a man of substance. So Jacob sent some messengers back to brother Esau with a message of peace uh, and reconciliation. Say, come on, brother, we need to get together. I miss you. I'd like to see you again. Uh, and so the report, uh, the messengers go and they bring back a report from him. Now, how would you feel if you heard that your brother got the message and he's coming to meet you with 400 men? I don't know about you, but I think I'd be looking for another place to hide. Uh, you know, I, I'd go run it. And that's kind of the way Jacob felt right now. Uh, you know, he's bringing 400 men. It's not just so he can say, it's okay, brother. Uh, he's, he's upset. He's, he's ticked off. So now, night has fallen, and he's wondering what tomorrow will bring. Th that unfinished business uh, is going to come back now to haunt him. By the way, it'll do that to all of us. 
Any unfinished business will come back to haunt you. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. So just mark it down. Sooner or later, you've got to go back and face your unfinished business. You've got to go back and confront the past and own up to what you did uh, and deal with it. So Jacob sends his wives and his family across the Jabbok River along with all of his possessions, and he sends a peace offering with his servant uh, to present to Esau. Notice this. Jacob stays behind. He sends the kids. He sends the women. He sends the servants. says, take a peace offering to Esau. But is Jacob at the head of it? Uh Uh-uh. Jacob's still hiding behind a rock. Uh, He's not ready for this yet, but he's hoping that when Esau sees he has a family and sees his nephews and nieces and his uh, sisters-in-law, that he's going to be a happy man. And uh, so there, that night, with everybody gone, Jacob is alone. There he wrestles with an angel of the Lord. And it was that wrestling match that changed him. Now, let me just tell you this. First of all, you don't have to have a wrestling match with an angel to change. Uh, That's what it took in Jacob's case. Some of us may be that stubborn, uh, and if so, God can do something about it. But let me just show you what happened uh, in this wrestling match, because then you're going to see what needs to happen with you if you want to change. First of all, we must face ourselves. Uh, It tells us in verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. Did you know that the greatest enemy most of us face is self itself. Uh, I remember an old cartoon strip, um, uh, Pogo, I think it was, and Pogo uh, goes out and comes back, and he's spied out the enemy. He says, I have seen the enemy, and it is us. <clears throat> it's true for all of us. Uh, our biggest enemy is us. James puts it this way in James 4, 1 and 2, from whence come fightings and wars among you? Come they not hence even of your own lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and obtain not. You fight in war, yet you have not, because you ask not. It was Jesus that said, uh, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. One of the hardest parts uh, of, of allowing God to change us is to face the fact that my problem is not my parents, my problem is not other people, it's not other Christians, my problem is me. And that's tough for us because we want to blame somebody else. We want to point our fingers at someone else. Well, they're not friendly or they're not nice to me and on and on and on. The problem is not them. The problem is you. You have to deal with you. Uh, And you have to be, you know, if we be as as much concerned about ourselves as we are about some other people, we'd be in good shape today. Uh, But the problem is we're not as concerned about ourselves as we ought to. So Jacob had to face the sin in his life. Folks, none of us are going to be able to change until, first of all, we become uncomfortable with our present situation. You see, Jacob had been a schemer all of his life. He'd lied. He had deceived. Then he went running off to Uncle Laban, where he had to deal with years of of abuse and deceit. And Jacob needed to realize that all the suffering that he experienced in Laban's household was simply him reaping what he had sown. He had been a deceiver. He had been a a liar. Now Laban's doing the same thing to him, and he was suffering from it. So he wants to go home. He wants to see his brother, and he's scared. He wanted God's help, but he still didn't recognize his own sinfulness and his unwillingness to submit to God. You know, that's hard for a lot of us. We can see other people's sin. We can see their stubbornness, but we refuse to see our own. I have a a friend from college that uh, lives in Wyoming. He shared this with me a long time ago uh, because one day we had to go out and uh, uh, we were there for spring break. We were doing a vacation or kind of a uh, a vacation Bible school in May or in April. uh, And uh, we were doing it for this little church. But his dad came and said, hey, uh, guys, the bull got out out of the, and he's headed for the cow pasture. Will you go get him? So some of the guys hopped on a horse. I hopped on the horse and hopped right back off. 
I got a little motor scooter and took off, you know. Uh, and we went, went looking for it. Uh, and we finally found the bull. And sure enough, he was trying to break down the fence to get in the cow pasture. Uh, and uh, Lynn, my friend, uh, lo- roped him and brought him back. Uh, and I said, well, how often do, do cows get out? He said, I mean, you got everything fenced off. What happens? So he said, now, there's a lot of cattle ranches around here. And he told me, he said, what happens is this. He said, uh, a cow starts nibbling on, on a tuft of green grass. And when he gets finished, he goes to the next tuft of green grass. And he keeps on going. Uh, and he, he starts nibbling next to a hole in the fence. Uh, and then he sees a tuft of green grass on the other side. So he just goes on through and eats that as well and just keeps on moving. Before you know it, he's lost. He just keeps following after the next tuft of grass and doesn't pay any attention to the borders. You know what? America's, Americans are in the process today of nibbling their way to being lost. We move from one tuft of activity to another, never noticing how far we've gone from home or how far away from the truth we've managed to end up. Folks, God had to, to get Jacob somehow to see his need. So a man suddenly appears. He begins to wrestle with Jacob. Jacob probably thinks it's a a bandit or maybe even a killer that Esau sent after him. Uh, And so they begin to to get engaged in the battle of Jacob's life. They wrestle and they wrestle uh, hour after hour after hour. Jacob's exhausted, uh, but he doesn't dare stop because he doesn't want to show a a sign of weakness. And then as the sun begins to rise over the hills of Gilead, the mystery man reaches out and touches Jacob's thigh and dislocates it immediately. Jacob later discovers who that man was in verse 30. He said, I have seen God face to face and my life was preserved. Well, actually, he saw the angel of God. Uh, And the fact is this man could have beaten Jacob any time he chose. But that wasn't his goal. His goal was to humble Jacob. His goal was to get Jacob to realize that he, without God, was nothing. Now, I've often wondered, why did God touch his thigh? And uh, so when I had knee surgery, I figured this is a good time to ask. Uh, So I asked my doctor. Uh, I said, do you have any idea why uh, the angel of the Lord touched Jacob's thigh? He said, sure. That's the largest and strongest muscle in the body. So he said, when he touched Jacob's thigh, uh, he was crippling Jacob at his greatest point of strength. And then it came to me, he was pointing out to Jacob that when you wrestle with God, you always lose. When you wrestle with him, you always lose. Now, get this, Jacob knew the right word, he performed the right actions, but his heart still wasn't completely the Lord's. Do you know how easy it is to have superficial faith? It often takes a crisis to get us to grasp hold of the fact that without God, I am nothing. And I need him more than I need anybody or anything else. Uh, And I need to hang on to him. And I need him to help me. See, folks, God can't do his wonderful work of changing in you until you finally admit to him, you need to change. God didn't just want Jacob's worship. God wanted his heart. He wanted his heart completely surrendered to him. All right, secondly, we must recognize our need for God's help. Look in verse 26. He said, let me go, for the day breaketh. Jacob's crippled now. And he calls out uh, to the Lord. He says, well then, uh, he said, I'll not let thee go then, uh, except thou bless me. He realizes he needs the blessing of God in his life. Uh, and he says, Lord, I, this hurts, but I'm not going to let you go uh, until you bless me. And then there's not only that, but there's a new confession here in verse 27. He said unto them, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Now, I love that. Here's God saying, what's your name? God knew his name, but God wanted to make sure Jacob understood. He needed for Jacob to confess the truth about himself because the name Jacob means deceiver. Deceiver. He's saying, I'm a deceiver. I'm a deceitful man. Uh, I've lied. Uh, and uh, he, he did. He told his father that he was Esau and stole the blessing uh, from his father. Now, after years uh, of running away uh, and looking over his shoulder before an all-knowing and all-seeing heavenly God, he's seeking God's blessing. 
Jacob understands the indictment behind the, God's question. He said, my name is Jacob, and God says, all right, you've spoken the truth. You know what your name means. You've been a deceitful man, but now I acknowledge that you know who you are, and I'm going to be able to change you, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Let's change your name to Israel. Jacob had to recognize God's right to rule in his life. He wanted God's power in his life, but he didn't want to surrender every area of his life to the Lord. He wanted to be in control. I read um, this past fall, I believe it was, about the man over by Detroit uh, was playing in a soccer game, and he was enraged with the referee. And so uh, while the referee wasn't looking, the guy came around and with a sucker punch hit him, knocked him to the ground, and the referee died. Just 43 years old. Uh, and the, the guy who did it just, was just declared guilty in court, uh, probably is going to have to serve a jail term, a very long jail term, and when he's done, be deported uh, because he's not even legally here, uh, and they're going to have to take care of that. But I thought, here's a guy that doesn't want to follow the rules. you got a referee telling you exactly what's supposed to happen. He didn't like it. Uh, and so he takes matters into his own hands, and while the referee died, this guy still lost. He lost everything. He's going to lose his life. Uh, he's going to be in prison for years and years, and then he's going to be sent away from this country. All of us seem to want God's help, but we want it on our terms, and it just doesn't work that way. Uh, I remember reading about a lady in the north of England. Every time she got down to pray, God would bring some silverware to her mind. Uh, and she knew what had happened. She, years ago, had taken the items wrongfully uh, from a woman where she was a housekeeper, and uh, she had not been able to pray. So she goes to her pastor, and she says, what am I going to do? He says, you've got to make restitution. She said, but the person's dead now. He said, well, are there some of the heirs living? She said, yeah, he's got a son. She, he said, then, then you need to go and pay him back. She said, well, boy, I, I want God's blessing on my life, but I, I can't do that. My, my reputation's at stake. So she went away. She came back the next day and said, how about if I just put the money in the offering plate? Uh, and the pastor said, no, God doesn't want your stolen money. The only thing you can do is make restitution. So she carried that burden for several days, finally drove out into the country and found the son, made a full confession, uh, gave him more than enough money to pay for it. And the son said, I don't want the money. And she finally persuaded him to take it and came back with such joy and peace on her face. And she said, now, for once, I can meet with God face to face. The guilt is gone. You see, folks, you got to do it on God's terms. You can't do it on your terms. We, we, get, we got to get the stumbling stones out of the way. God doesn't want a man to shout hallelujah who doesn't pay his debts. Many of our prayer meetings are, are killed by, by folks praying who, whose lives aren't right. And, and God can't hear those prayers because sin builds up a wall between us and God. A, a person might stand high in the community, might be a, a member of the church in good standing, but the question is, how does he stand in the sight of God? If there's anything wrong in our lives, we need to make it right. So God names him Israel. It goes from, the literal translation of Jacob is actually heel grabber. Uh, and it goes from heel grabber to one who persists with God. So either way, he was persistent, but now he's persistent in the right way. One of our greatest problems is that many of us give up before God can actually do his work in us. Uh, we're so used to watching TV and everything getting solved in 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Uh, you know, and all the problems are taken care of. But God has a, a work to do in us, and it takes some time. We got in this mess, and it took us a while. And God's going to take a while to get us out of it as he works in our lives. And that brings me to the third thing. If you're going to change, we must recognize the need for God's presence in our lives. You see, folks, that was the problem all along. Jacob wanted his desires, he wanted his timing, he wanted his methods, and even though he professed to know God, he didn't really know God. <clears throat> when we really know God, some things happen. We'll put our past behind us because God does. When we really know God, we'll see that no matter how many times we failed before, God's power can still change us. 
When we really know God, we'll trust Him to do what He wants with us because we know His way is always perfect. So Jacob names the place Peniel, which means face of God. And now he walks with a limp as a perpetual reminder of what God had done that night on the banks of Jabbok. Now, I'm not saying you've got to go out somewhere in the wilderness and sit next to a rock and have a fight with an angel to get right with God. I am saying that we need to do what Jacob did. We need to be honest with ourselves. We need to realize that maybe there's something in our life that God wants to change and God is eager to change, but we're not giving him any room. Uh, We want to hang on to it. We don't want to let go. So let me give you these five things to to think about, uh, and we'll be done. First of all, God allows struggles in our lives in the hopes of getting us to depend on Him. If everything's going good, why pray? You know, why call on God? Everything's fine. I got no problems. I got no reason to bother Him. God knows we're that way. And so God sends the troubles, and God sends the trials so that we will actually get on our knees, and depend on Him. Secondly, and this is the tough one, especially uh, in this day and age, until we're broken, we can never be greatly used by God. God can't use self-reliant people. He tells us several times in the Bible, He looks for those with a broken and contrite heart. God wants His people broken so that He can put the pieces back together again put them back together his way. But it can't happen until we see what God sees in our lives, until we see the bad as well as the good, and we understand what it's doing and that it's a stumbling block. Then God will break us of that as we we realize it's sin in his sight, and we need to deal with it. Thirdly, until we admit the truth about our condition, we're going to remain as we are. It's not going to get better. You're not going to see any more of the power of God in your life until we admit the truth about our condition. Four, once God breaks us, and it's a painful thing, but once he breaks breaks us, we'll look back on that experience with gratitude. With gratitude. And lastly, the greatest problem in life is not our circumstances. It's our heart. It's our heart. Many of our circumstances are what they are because our heart is what it is. And until we deal with our heart and make sure that it's right with God, you're going to continually have circumstances overwhelm you. They're going to burden you down till you get your heart right with God. I think for some reason we've always thought when people say get your heart right with God, that's talking to unsaved people. I don't think so. I think it's talking to Christians. Christians need to get their heart right with God. Unsaved people just plain need to get born again. They need to get saved. But Christians need to get their hearts right with God. We need to be open and honest before the Lord. One of the great revivals that took place under Charles Finney on the East Coast uh, began, uh, he got up to preach, and he started to preach about sin, and a man just stood up and started weeping made his way to the altar and just started crying. And Finney didn't know what to do about it. He figured they'd wait till the invitation, but the guy's doing it already. So he said, well, somebody come over here and pray for him. So another person comes over, puts his arm around him, and they begin to talk. Both of them are crying. Uh, and Finney's trying to preach, and they're still crying. And Finney finally says, um, before I go ahead with this sermon, if there's somebody else that needs to come uh, to the altar, you come on. And so one by one, almost the entire congregation came to the front. They began to weep, and God began to break them as they admitted their sin. Then he said, when that happened, the windows of heaven opened. And he said, the service lasted, it started at 7 that night, it lasted to 2 in the morning, not because I preached long. He said, I never get, did get to preach the sermon. He said, people just kept coming. They, they'd leave, and they'd go out, and they'd find a neighbor or whatever, tell them what's happening. They'd bring them back, and they were getting right with God. And that went on for weeks as it began to spread throughout the East Coast as people just simply got honest with God. That's what God wanted from Jacob. That's what God wants from us.